Okay, I'll go ahead and get started as we have people filtering in. I'll just provide a brief introduction. Um, so welcome everyone today uh, to the UW Data Science Seminar Series. Um, this is, of course, an annual lecture series that we host here at the University of Washington um, through the eScience Institute and the Engineering Data Science Institute. And we host scholars working across applied areas of data science, such as the arts, engineering, humanities, and sciences, along with methodological areas in data science, such as computer science, applied math, and statistics. Um, we're delighted today to be um, joined by um, Sarah Ketchley um, and two of her students, um, Frederick Chan and Emma Fitzberg. Um, Sarah Ketchley is an Egyptologist and an art history scholar in the Department of Near Eastern Languages and Civilization at the University of Washington. Um, she teaches introductory and graduate level classes in digital humanities. Um, and she directs a student digital humanities internship program, which I believe that's where Frederick and Emma um, are joining us from. Um, and today they're going to be talking about um, a project um, that Sarah has been working on for some years called the Emma B. Andrews Diary Project. Um, and um, they're going to dive into um, databases and digital editions of 19th century Nile travel logs. Um, and I will turn it over to Sarah and team. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sarah, um, for the welcome and for the introduction. Um, and as um, Sarah mentioned, um, I'm, an, I'm based in Near Eastern languages and civilizations. I trained primarily as an Egyptologist, um, but I teach mostly introductory and graduate level classes in digital humanities, um, both for NELC, uh, for informatics, and occasionally for computational linguistics. So today, I'm going to talk about the digital humanities research and project work I've been doing for the past nine years, primarily focused on Nile travel and excavation in Egypt in the 19th and early 20th centuries, which has come to be known as the golden age of Egyptology. I'm delighted to be joined by two of my interns today. Emma Fritzberg graduated from the UW in 2019, majoring in computer science with minors in Swedish language and art history. And Emma now works as a software engineer at Zillow. Frederick Chan is a class of 2023 student in linguistics who intends to enter the computational linguistics program in the future. So next slide. So I'll begin by telling you a little bit about the diarist who, whose work prompted my journey into digital humanities to give you a sense of why her work is significant for the disciplinary history of Egyptology. The scope of the material we're working with has expanded beyond the Andrews journals and now includes a range of unpublished primary source diaries, letters and other printed or handwritten material from this period. I'm particularly interested in archival material which has been created by some of the lesser known or hidden figures of Egyptology, many of whom are often women. So I'll tell you a little bit about the internship program in digital humanities, which I co-founded in 2011. And then I'll summarize some of the work we've been doing this academic year before handing over to Emma and Frederick to talk about the reader and database that they've been working on. So next slide. Um, Mrs. Emma Buttles Andrews was something of a unique woman for the period that she lived in. She was independently wealthy, she was opinionated, and she comes across as something of a force to be reckoned with in the written record that she left behind. She moved away from her hometown of Columbus, Ohio in the 1880s, where she'd lived with her husband. Um, and she moved into the Newport mansion of Theodore Davis, um, and she lived there as his mistress. Davis had been a lawyer to the robber barons of New York uh, before retiring with his um, fortune, which he made under somewhat dubious circumstances. Um, and he moved to Newport to begin collecting art and antiquities during what would become regular trips to Egypt from 1889 onwards. Emma was his constant traveling companion until Theodore's death in 1915. And so you're looking at the only picture I found of Emma, which was taken in February 1890 in Luxor, Egypt, on board this Dahabia uh, named the Nubia. 
And she's one of the extremely indistinct uh, female figures that is seated on the deck. So her travel journal is significant for a number of reasons, not least because of the detailed cultural and social history of 19th century Egypt it provides. And for Egyptologists, it's an important record of Theodore Davis's extensive excavations in the Valley of the Kings. And it's also a record of art and antiquities collecting and other contemporary archeology span in Egypt. I'm interested in tracking the development of Egypt's tourist industry and the effect it had on the ancient monuments, and also how Emma's record fits into the broader canon of Egyptian travel memoirs of the time. So prior to his death in 1915, Theodore Davis excavated 18 of the 42 royal tombs now known in the Valley of the Kings, including what was the best preserved tomb to be found in Egypt at the time, before the discovery of Tutankhamun's tomb in 1922. And Emma was present at the um, opening of many of these tombs and her diaries provide a detailed account of their condition, um, of visitors to the sites and the many archeological discoveries. And her work is often more detailed than the contemporary formal tomb publications, um, some of which are pictured here. And these were sponsored by Theodore Davis and written by some of the foremost Egyptologists of the time. Working with the content of Emma's diaries led me to become quite intrigued by Emma herself, um, because really very little is known about her. And so I began visiting archives across the US um, and the UK as well to dig out as much information about um, her life and her travels as I could find. And I'm making um, admittedly slow progress in writing her biography. Along the way, I began to add to the project's digital archives, either by taking photographs of related digital, uh, historical material during my visits, or by mining the web for contemporary publications like um, books and newspapers. So here are a few examples of this primary source material. Um, Lindsley Foot Hall was an Oregon native, and in fact, his archive is in the Oregon Historical Society in Portland. And he trained as a draftsman at MIT and was a member of the team when Tutankhamun's tomb was opened. Um, I've gathered uh, some of the unpublished research notes written by Howard Carter during his time working for Theodore Davis as his uh, archaeologist, uh, before he more famously started working with Lord Carnarvon um, and found uh, Tutankhamun's tomb. And then I also have a selection of letters, including the beautiful one you see here, um, letters and diaries written by the artist Joseph Lyndon Smith, um, who worked and recorded some of Davis's digs. So I'll take a few minutes now to uh, give you an overview of our digital humanities internship program, which um, we've referred to earlier. And I'll give you a sense of its origins and its goals and what we're working on this academic year. So I co-founded uh, New Book Digital Text with two other faculty members in 2011. And the main goal of our partnership was to work with lesser known or understudied primary source texts from the Near East, which may otherwise be lost or remain in some way inaccessible. And our method for preservation is through digitization using non-proprietary open source technologies. And this process of digital publication has generated a wealth of machine readable text. And as academics, it's provided us with the means of delving into historical research using computational methods methodologies. We've been able to involve our undergraduate student interns in all aspects of this research work, which we feel is one of the strengths and unique features of the work that we do. So over 10 years, we've worked with more than 230 University of Washington undergraduate students and several graduate assistants. And students come to us from departments across campus. I advertise on the um, undergraduate research um, No prerequisites for joining our group. Um, and um, 
that most of the interns who join us um, have in common a shared love of history and of literature and also curiosity about how digital humanities and computer technology fits into this picture. And students work on various aspects of the project at any given time, including transcription, encoding, historical research, uh, project management, marketing, and web development. So this school year, um, we're focusing on uh, publishing our completed transcriptions. Uh, which includes an archive of personal letters written by Helen Winlock, uh, the wife of the director of the Metropolitan Museum's Egyptian Expedition. And she's pictured here seated at the bottom right of the photograph. One of my interns transcribed the bulk of the materials between 2019 and 2020. And I'm now collaborating with another student to proofread and edit these transcriptions using a platform called Tropy, which displays both the original letter, as you can see here, and the transcription, as well as all the relevant metadata for each letter. And then next slide. I have another intern who's building a database of passengers on tourist steamers in the late 19th century. Um, and we've compiled these from various postcard records kept by the tour operator, Thomas Cook and Sons. And this in particular will be an invaluable resource for researchers who are tracking the ebb and flow of tourist traffic at this time. And then we have um, two groups of interns who are focusing on text encoding and biographical research for the Emma Andrews diary. Both groups have been making headway in systematically preparing diary volumes for publication. And we collaborate using a range of project collateral, including these instruction manuals. Um, we work on GitHub, Slack, and shared Google spreadsheets. And at this point, um, I'm going to pass the baton over to Emma, who is going to expand on some of this ongoing work. Hi, I, my name is Emma, and I'm going to share a little bit about the process of creating an online immersive document reader for Emma Andrews diary volumes. Some of the goals we started out with were to publish the volumes online in an accessible and engaging format for other scholars, students, or anybody who is interested, um, and to provide the context about people, places, objects, boats, et cetera, necessary to understand what's going on in the diary entries and to make connections. This is helpful because there are so many people that Emma interacted with and places she traveled from European capitals to archeological sites on the Nile. We also wanted to learn about the tools and processes which were best suited for doing this and to document our findings for future projects using other document sets. We started out with the historical markup tool which was a previous student's natural language processing thesis project. Um, this tool converts plain text diary entries into XML files and names of people and places are tagged in the output XML, but it's not perfect. So each volume must be checked over by a human. And we've been growing our team of students, which is working on this. However, the tool does give us a large head start. We also have compiled a Google sheet of contextual information about people and places, which is still being compiled by student researchers. To build the reader interface, we're using TEI Publisher, which is an open source toolbox for building document readers. TEI, the text encoding initiative, is a set of guidelines on how to encode information from diaries, letters, poems, novels, and many other types of source material. The guidelines are maintained by an international consortium of digital humanities scholars. Um, it mostly is in Europe, but it's also starting to be used more widely in the US as well. The goal of TEI is to standardize how text is represented so that projects can be passed on from creators to maintainers with ease. TEI definitely still allows for some flexibility and we make decisions as a team on which elements are best suited for a particular purpose as we go. In TEI Publisher, each document view is generated based on three sources. The TEI XML source code is the actual diary text 
which is tagged according to the TEI guidelines. Um, the page template is written in HTML and CSS, and it determines the layout of the page. And the ODD contains processing instructions, which specify how each TEI element should look and behave. So here's a few examples of readers created with TEI. This one has a facsimile view of a section of a Midsummer Night's Dream on the right and a transcription of the text on the left. And this one is a multi-part view with the original Dutch text of a letter from Vincent van Gogh to his brother Theo, the English translation in the center and footnotes on the right. Um, ExistDB, are an open source XML database, will run TEI Publisher on a UW server and will store our XML and HTML files. We're still working with UW IT to get this up and running, but once it is, um, the diaries will be published online. And we've been using GitHub to collaborate on human checking the XML diary files because since it's a large team, it's um, necessary to have a sort of version control. Um, and I've written some scripts as well using Google Apps Script, which interfaces the Google Sheets to generate XML, in, interfaces with Google Sheets um, to generate XML files containing contextual information that we use in the reader. So now I'll show a brief demo of the diary. And you can see that we've added a couple features, um, including a toggle between um, viewing the entire volume 17 and viewing a single entry in volume 17. This is the sample one. Um, you can also go back and forth once you are if you're in the single entry view or view the entire volume at once. Um, we have date pop-ups for, uh, so you can remember like what year it is and days of the week, things like that. Um, we also have implemented a info drawer to keep track of the context. Um, for example, for cities and for people so that you can keep track of the context while you're reading and make connections. Um, our next steps are to complete human checking on all 17 diary volumes. We started at the end with volume 17 because they tend to be longer at the beginning. So um, we are still working through that, progress, that process with um, a team of students. Uh, we are also continuing to research and compile contextual information about the people and places and other attributes in the text. Um, we're going to add different, uh, different styles to the reader. Um, I'm sure you noticed that the Shakespeare and the Van Gogh um, pages had some interesting and fun um, theming, and we're going to make ours look a little bit more unique and interesting. Um, we also want to add more engaging media uh, than text only, such as photos or possibly maps to show the progress of the, um, of the trip as you go on the diaries. And we also are planning to get our TEI publisher instance up and running on a UW server. So with that, I'll hand it over to Frederick. Okay, thank you. And um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. Uh, can everybody see this? Yes. OK, cool. Yep. All right. Uh, right. Hello, my name is Frederick Chan. I'm the developer for Nile Travelogs. And today I'm going to be talking about how I made uh, the Nile Travelogs database uh, using only uh, a single book and turn it into a, a library where you can read all sorts of uh, travelogs from people from the or who, who went to the Nile in the golden age of Egyptology. And so the goal of the database is to be able to uh, search through all of these travelers and these publications by uh, name, nationality, any attributes um, that might be helpful for research. 
Uh, we want to be able to access this information very quickly. And we also want to be able to read them, of course. And eventually, I also want to know, uh, you know where travelers are going, what they encountered. Um, and so that way, we can get a, a broader context for these, these travel logs. And so with uh, now notes of a Hawaji, um, that, is, uh, that is the book we started with, and it contains information on the travel logs of hundreds of travelers who, who went to Egypt during that time. Um, the one problem though, is that it exists only in print and in order to uh, digitize it, of course you have to scan it and then you have to have a computer attempt to read all the text in there. And so in a perfect world, uh, when you scan this and have a computer turn it into plain text, um, it, it will look exactly like this. There will be uh, no errors whatsoever. And so you can see at the top here, we have, um, this is an example of the traveler, um, a list of publications they created uh, detailing their travels, uh, when they traveled, their nationality, and of course, uh, very nice um, summaries of each of these publications. So in a perfect world, we can just take a regular expression and bam, uh, we can put it in a database. But unfortunately, the, the reality of OCR text um, is not so clean, right? And usually, uh, oftentimes, you'll see these artifacts and these type. Right? So little things can break software um, if, if you haven't written the parsing software correctly. Right? So for example, you can see up here, uh, here is a, um, I believe this is a, a page header actually. So there's like a page number here and it's splitting this, this summary of a publication in two. Oh, well, that's not good. Um, and here, this is actually in the original text, item number not used. Well, that breaks our uh, parsing paradigm. And then here's this with like a typo. So we can't really you know, parse this perfectly but um, perhaps there's a workaround for this. So the, uh, the algorithm I developed is basically, you just look at the, these paragraphs here and you try and parse them line by line. So right now, suppose we want to parse uh, publication number 359. Okay, so here's the name of the traveler. Um, okay, this is their publication. This is their uh, information, the summary. Okay, that's great. And now we want to look at uh, number 360. OK, so this, is, uh, this line is good. This line looks fine. But oh no, uh, what is this? Well, that's, uh, this is supposed to be um, the date of travel, but uh, there's some weird artifact here. So when this happens, what we want to do is we want to alert the user um, that there's an anomaly. We store that. And once it's done uh, looking at all of the entries in the book, uh, we say, hey, uh, number 360, uh, you should probably check that. So you have a human um, you know, look at any anomalies that pop up. So what's nice about this is uh, since we have hundreds and hundreds of travelers we have to process, and, uh, we, and specifically 361, we were able to do 90% of these without any user input whatsoever. Um, and uh, in the end, we do have a few structural errors where it thinks that one section is another section, um, but those are fairly rare. And so uh, now I'd like to have a demo of uh, Nile Travelogs here. Um, so this is what the landing page looks like. Uh, and we can go up here to browse by title. And um, so here we go. So we have a nice big list of publications we can look at. And there's a handy dandy little icon that tells you whether or not you can read the publication on this site. Um, and so there's uh, multiple ways to look through these. Uh, this one's by traveler name. So you can see traveler and publications. We can see um, publications by when the traveler went to Egypt, uh, which is handy. Uh, and also you can search by a variety of different um, search options here, such as uh, gender or nationality, even uh, whatever the summary contains. So uh, suppose, OK. Uh, let's see. So there's a uh, one called a private journal, which uh, looks rather well, and um, it was written by uh, someone from Britain. Oh, here we go. Okay, so we can read this. Um, and so if we expand here, we can see uh, the summary information, all the information about this publication. And down here we have uh, what is called a triple IF reader, 
which allows us to look at scans of this book and we can, uh, of course, read the contents. Um, and the IIIF reader, basically the way it works is uh, we obtain a IIIF manifest, which tells us where these scans exist. In this case, it's the internet archive. And we uh, obtain this manifest by searching the um, internet archive API for the title of the book, as well as the author, author's name, uh, which produces some rather accurate results. So here we go. Uh, we get to read all of these things. Oh, here's a nice picture. Um, and so, yeah, that, that is basically what we have right now. Uh, in the future, uh, what I'd like to do is, let me see, uh, let's present again. Okay. All right. In the future, what I'd like to do is to be able to enrich uh, this text with, with full information pop-ups. So when you click on it, it says, ooh, the Great Pyramid of Giza was built you know, in such and such time. It exists in such and such location. And even you know, what other publications mentioned this, this item. Um, the main problem is with this is that unlike the uh, 17 um, diaries that we saw earlier, uh, there's hundreds uh, of publications and thousands of pages of content. So we can't possibly do this manually. Um, so uh, as mentioned earlier, uh, Audrey Holmes's historical markup tool is, is my basis for uh, creating an automated process for looking through these thousands of pages of content. And so the way it works is uh, down here, we have the user and the user has a bunch of, uh, has some source text. And the user gives this source text to the web server, which gives it to uh, the Flare NLP, which has a, a entity recognition model. What this model does is it looks at the text and says, hey, that looks like a person's name. And you know, that looks like a, a location name, but it doesn't actually know what that entity is. Okay, well, that's, at least it's better than nothing. And so it gives it to the markup generator. It generates some TEI markup uh, and gives it back to the user who can then of course enhance it with uh, more research, more information. But um, since we have so much content, is there a way to make this better? Can we do this uh, you know, multiple at a time as well? And so this is what uh, I've been working on. And this is current research. This is called Lestrade, um, which is my own TEI tagger. And the reason I call it Lestrade is because it uh, sort of resembles the way uh, Lestrade works in the Sherlock Holmes novels. Um, so if you've read Sherlock Holmes or perhaps seen the TV show, you'll know that Inspector Lestrade, he usually has um, some case that he can't solve. Uh, and so he gives it to uh, Sherlock Holmes. Sherlock Holmes has superior you know, observation skills. He has a seemingly encyclopedic knowledge about everything in the universe, right? So in this scenario, uh, what we're doing is Sherlock is actually the Wolfram engine, which was made by the same people who um, made Wolfram Alpha. And so the Wolfram engine is not only able to detect you know, that there are entities in the text, but also knows what those entities are. And so Lestrade can ask um, the Wolfram engine, hey, you know, I've got some text. Tell me about the entities in here. And then we can just, Lestrade can keep track of all of the different texts that uh, it wants the Wolfram engine to detect. So this is the, the sort of architecture of, of what it looks like. Um, we have the user down here. He has a lot of source text. And so we give it to Lestrade. Um, so there's a bash client. It keeps track of all the different texts that we want to look at. And one by one, it gives it to the Wolfram engine, right? And in return, what we get is uh, not only the, uh, the fact that there's an entity there, but also detailed information about that entity. And it gives it to the Lestrade's markup generator, and it generates uh, a, a bunch of TEI markup as, uh, as the historical markup tool does, but also a TEI index, which contains all the information uh, about entities within that text across every single text that we have given the Wolfram engine. So what I intend to do with this is, of course, to put it in the uh, T publisher instance, which is on the server. Um, we store the TI markup there. We put the TI index there. And like before, we talked about the uh, ODD spec, the 
uh, which transforms our TEI into something the client can see. And so we use TI Publisher web components to display this uh, enhanced text. And whenever you click on this, uh, any entity there, what I wanna be able to do is to transclude the information about the, for example, the Great Pyramid of Giza, of Giza in the TI index into the client. So you can see, you can click on it, hey, uh, the Great Pyramid of Giza is here. It, it, it was built by this person, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that is the sort of uh, feature I want to build. Uh, thank you. Thanks everyone for listening into our presentation. And if you have any um, questions, do feel free to ask them in the um, Q and A. Thanks, Sarah. Yeah. I wasn't sure if you guys were wrapping up as a group <laughs> or someone else was coming on. So no, that was for, us. <laughs> for, for a bit of delay. So please do um, uh, everyone drop your questions in. And um, while we're um, waiting for questions, um, I had a, a couple questions, and my first one is a silly one, Emma. But did you get involved in this project because they of the um, the diary author also having the name Emma? <laughs> um, I think that's a fun fun coincidence. Yeah, no, I got <laughs> into the project because I'm really interested in the intersection of art history and the humanities. Um, I minored in art history and majored in computer science, so the intersection of the humanities, art history, and tech. Um, and this was just like a perfect project for that. Yeah, very cool. Yeah, I was I was mostly just teasing, but you guys did such a I just well, just wanted to say also you did such a wonderful presentation um, and really enjoyed actually that the three part split um, was a great way to, to bring the material across. Um, one of the things that I wondered, Emma, I think it was this was actually in your part um, was you talked about style and adding in style and I'm not sure I quite followed what you meant in that context. Um, um, yeah, so I was talking um, about, I, I'm sure you guys noticed in some of the examples that I showed with the Shakespeare document reader and the Van Gogh letters, um, there is a custom style so they can pick colors and they can pick background images and they can really um, make the, their reader more and more unique. Um, and then in our demo right now, we've really focused more on getting the content down and the functionality down, but um, there's a lot of room for our, um, our project to become more engaging and more um, interesting to look at. So that could mean changing colors, changing fonts, moving things around the page anything anything like that and we can do it through um, changing the HTML and CSS. Great, that makes sense. Thanks. Um, let's see, we have a question um, from the audience. Um, Andrews asks, what kind of photo and map materials are you interested in adding to the project? So um, in our biographical research, I have a group of seven students currently um, looking to write mini biographies for each of the people that Emma mentions in her diary. And along the way, we're trying to source um, photographs of those individuals. And we do have a fairly large collection um, at the moment. And those will go into the slide out drawers that Emma, Emma was showing um, during her demo. So we have photos of people. Then I have a large collection of um, site specific photographs as well. So different archeological sites um, in Egypt, which are contemporary to Emma's diary. So we can get a sense of what the sites looked like when she was visiting. Um, and then in terms of maps, I've, I've been um, gradually collecting contemporary maps as well, because it was pre Aswan Dam. Um, and so the, the course of the Nile, um, particularly around Luxor was slightly different um, than um, some, of the, some of the more modern maps. So I think it's important to, to use maps that were, were um, contemporary with Emma's, uh, with Emma's diaries and also 
Um, often they will show buildings uh, that, that were there at the time. For example, they have the inspector of antiquities house. Um, they have Howard Carter's house on some of the maps I've collected. So it's really interesting to be able to see, you know, who was, who was living where, um, different schools and places like that. So that's the type of material I'm targeting at the moment. And Sarah, I'm wondering if, if you could talk about what are the, um, you know, I guess it, particularly in um, Emma's diaries are, I guess, what are the things that are most surprising or interesting that you've come across? And I guess I'm thinking maybe particularly from the perspective of a woman who, you know, at a time when women didn't have as much access to being able to travel and explore the world, if, if, that, if, if that was among the types of things she talked about in the diary, or if it was really more about other subject matter. Um, well, Emma, Emma was um, somewhat um, cloistered from the rest of the hoi polloi in the sense that, uh, you know, she was an extremely wealthy woman. So Theodore Davis was also very wealthy. They ended up building their own dahabia, which was probably the most sumptuous boat on the Nile at the time. It had a grand piano um, in the salon, a full library, four bedrooms, bathtub, um, etc. So I find um, the way that the contrast between the way that Emma was traveling and some of the descriptions of, you know, the um, local color, as she puts it, um, I find that, you know, quite telling. Uh, you know, the poverty that she is surrounded by um, is, is um, often tough to read about. Um, the, I, as an, as an archaeologist, an Egyptologist, um, her descriptions of some of the discoveries of the tombs and, you know, one in particular, KV 55, which um, is now believed to be the final resting place of the heretic Pharaoh Akhenaten, um, they did not do a great job of excavation there. A lot of material crumbled to dust, essentially. There were flakes of gold um, floating around in the air, uh, in people's hair. Um, they ended up carrying pieces of, of, um, of you know, archaeology, antiquities um, onto the boat, which they conveyed up to Cairo. So very different, very different time, but still somewhat alarming to read uh, at points. Um, and then her social network is, is fascinating to me. I mean, she was mixing with people like um, JP Morgan, um, Lord Cromer, you know, many of the, the dignitaries and gentry um, of the time. Um, she's a little bit of a name dropper, but it's, it, makes for, it makes for some good reading. And it seems that everyone is coming to tea on the Dahabia Bedouin. <laughs> I think when you're reading someone else's diary, it's good that they're a name dropper, right? <laughs> yes. Nicoletta, did you have a question? I saw you sort of leaning in. I don't know. Oh, you're... I'm muted. So yeah, you're muted. Sorry. I was also um, wondering about the content of the actual diary because it, I was curious if it's more of a travel, you know, story versus... In how informative it is for learning more about the Egypt of those times, of those times. And um, I was wondering about the, I think this is important in many ways and I'm, I'm glad you're doing this and providing all this information for other researchers because I was wondering like uh, what is most useful from her uh, stories. Yeah, so, um... Emma's original handwritten diaries are now lost. Um, so what we're working from is a typewritten copy made in um, 1919 by a typist at the Metropolitan Museum. Um, and Emma's first um, three or four volumes are, are quite long and very detailed. So she gives some fantastic information about Egypt um, at the time, the flora, the fauna, um, the people, um, archaeological sites. And those are things I'm particularly interested in um, mining for detail. And I'm interested in comparing what she says to what other travelers say. And that's where Frederick's work is so important. Um, 
you know, building a database of, of um, these uh, people who traveled the Nile and kept a written record of it. Um, and many of the records that Frederick is working with obviously went forward to publication, whereas um, Emma's did not. Um, and um, so I'm, I'm particularly interested in that. And Emma's is much more of a travelogue. You know, she'll have a day, a, a, a date, a location, and then what she did on that particular on that particular day. Whereas the accounts in the tra travelogues um, database tend to be um, often more story-like in in you know chapter by chapter. So those those are pretty useful. Um, I'm also interested in boat traffic along the Nile. Uh, so the Thomas Cook tour operators. Um, that's where our passenger cards come in. Um, I want to track nationalities, the travel of nationalities um, along the Nile. Um, but of course, this is all a lot of work. <laughs> and so, um, you know, I've been doing this now for a decade um, and I'm thrilled that we're finally moving into the publication phase. It feels for Emma's diaries that the end is finally coming into sight. Um, and that's largely thanks to the fantastic work of Emma and all the interns, um, Emma Fritzberg, um, and all the interns working on um, research, uh, transcription and encoding. Um, and then, you know, the expansion of our pro project into um, broader history of travel in Egypt. Um, again, thanks to Frederick's work, making this, this data widely accessible. So um, I think we're in a, in a fantastic, place at the moment and I'm excited to see where we move from here. Yeah, it's such an impressive um, body of work and, and that you got, what was it, 234 or 35 undergraduates have been involved is just a, a wonderful effort. Um, let's see, Frederick, I wanted to ask you, maybe we can wrap up with this question, but um, the historical marker tool that you talked about um, is that just for names of people's names and places or how does it, you said that the, you know, there's things that are tagged. Are those the two things that are tagged or does it extend to other things as well? Uh, yeah, um, the original uh, historical markup tool is able to detect four different types of entities. Uh, among them, of course, is uh, people's names and uh, names of places. I believe there are, two, there are two more, but I don't remember them off the top of my head. Uh, but uh, what I intended to do with Lestrade is, is to be able to um, not only encode like a lot of different, like detect a lot of different types of entities which appear in text, but also uh, get information about them. Yeah, and it seems like you're able to see how they, like Sarah was saying, how they relate to each other, um, which seems like a, a, an amazing tool and to bring the, these different or what seem like disparate bodies of work together um, and relational. Well, thank you all so much for joining us today. Um, really appreciate um, Emma and Frederick. You did a wonderful job speaking in front of this audience and transitioning, um, you know, the Zoom between speakers. And so, um, and thank you, Sarah, for sharing this work with us. And we will look forward to hearing more. And please do let us know when this um, these are published, um, so that maybe we can all take a look. <laughs> thank, thank you, you so very much. much. Thanks. Yeah. Bye-bye, everyone. We'll see you next week. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. Bye.